to Atheist Talk. My name is James Zimmerman. I'm going to be your host for this episode. Uh, today we're going to be talking about secularism and mental health. And to help me with that, we have a guest tonight, Jill Carlson. Welcome, Jill. Thank you, James. So why don't we start out by you telling us your <laughs> qualifications and experience with uh, mental health so that we can then explore the secularism aspect of it. Very good. Thank you. Um, as mentioned, my name is Jill Carlson, and I, currently I serve on the board, Minnesota Atheists. Um, why well, I'm qualified to talk about mental health, <laughs> I, I've, I'm licensed as a licensed provider. My credential is a licensed professional clinical counselor. Currently I work in private practice um, as a therapist, and uh, I serve a variety of populations, um, and, but areas of interest, uh, addiction, sexuality, um, women's issues, and I work with clients as young as age 11 up through the lifespan. Okay. I was trained locally here in the Twin Cities. My undergraduate degree is uh, from Hamlin, and my graduate degree is from a school in Richfield called the Adler Graduate School. Um, and my licensure, I was licensed in 2009. I've been in practi private practice now for about one year, and prior to that, I, um, I worked in managed health. Oh, okay. So um, this is a field I, perhaps as a small child, never thought I would, I would get into. Um, but it's certainly a rewarding career, and I think this topic is, is pretty critical for members of our secular community to discuss, to ponder, and also evaluate kind of where our culture is heading with this area. Okay, so thanks for telling us why you're sure. the right person to have here. <laughs> so then our question is, um, I guess the big question is, if you are an atheist, or at least if you're non-religious, some, mm -hmm. somewhere in the secular spectrum, why do you care about um, the secularism of your mental health provider, or why is that important? Excellent question. Thanks. Okay. Um, <laughs> here, here's a little bit of my philosophy okay. why this matters. Yep. Um, if I was seeking a provider perhaps for podiatry or dermatology, um, I'm not quite sure if that person's um, religiosity is very, very important mm -hmm. to me as a, as a potential patient. But mental health, I think I would argue, is very different. Maybe other concerns of a primary care or OBGYN could also fall in the same category, where you're making some very um, personal decisions mm -hmm. about healthcare, about um, path, choices, um, planning of your life with these types of providers. And you want to know exactly where their worldview stands. Now, does this mean you get to pry in the personal life of these types of providers? No. But I think in this culture now, we're seeing a surge of providers that do identify in certain ways as religiously identified providers. And my concern as a provider that does provide secular approaches to mental health, that some of these providers that are in the marketplace as, I'll say, Christian counselors, mm -hmm. are not fair in their marketing. It's not in the title of their clinic. It's not um, very clear to referral sources that they are identifying as a religious provider. So if you are secular, I, I do encourage one to do a little bit of research if they are referred, for example, by their insurance company to see a certain type of provider, to look a little bit deeper. Um, a couple of easy ways. Certainly a website of a provider can give you an in impression mm -hmm. if there's religiosity or not. Or um, credentials in terms of where they went to college, uh, if they went to a, a, a conservative or an evangelical school, oh, yeah. that can mm -hmm. send you a message mm -hmm. um, that maybe they do have this worldview. Not, not necessarily, but it yeah. can give you an indication one way or the other. Um, I, I think it's important to do a little bit of research in general, regardless if you are seeking a, a provider for more personal health care needs like mental health uh, or psychiatry, um, because I think some of the issues that are at the heart of why one is going to see a type of provider like this can also span the spectrum of um, topics that do relate to religion, family planning, um, abortion, uh, sexual trauma, sexual orientation. Um, and some of these topics do have uh, religious, religious implications. Yeah, sure. And, and if you, 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 having a, a provider that you know can be free of 
um, a religious uh, bias, I think is pretty critical. Also, it, it makes you feel safer as a patient. It gives you an impression that you're going to get an unbiased or an objective opinion. Um, just today, in fact, I, I had a, a client that told me that her last therapist sat down and prayed with her before they started the counseling session. Now, for this particular client, it, it, she found no objection to mm -hmm. it. But I can only imagine what it would be like for a member of our atheist community yeah. <laughs> to show up in a counselor's yeah. office that starts with a prayer. Um, it's not a good experience. It, mm -hmm. it doesn't feel like you're connected to the provider. Um, and and it, I think it, it, it can also give you a jaded perspective on what mental health services are all about. Oh, sure. I think it can scare one away from getting the help that they need well, if their first if, exposure was yeah. of a prayer. Yeah, that's what I was, what if, and what if some of their issues or trauma that they're bringing with them was, stems from a previously religious background? <laughs> The client, exactly. I mean, yeah. Exactly. So you mentioned that some uh, Christian providers or you know religious providers might not advertise that, but some Very do, right. don't they? Because I th yes. I don't know if I've made a conscious oh. note of it, but I think some, don't some do it to attract that particular clientele. It, 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 that's that's an excellent question. One would think that they would. Okay. At least <laughs> at least I would think yeah. that that would. Um, in my research, and I've actually, because this is my industry, I do do the research on this. I would say probably one to ten. Oh, okay. For every every nine Christian counseling offices that do not market themselves by the name, mm -hmm. there's about one that does. So for for you know the fifty <clears throat> largest Christian counseling clinics in the Twin Cities area, five do. Okay. Five identify in the title, you know, family Christian counseling counseling care with a Christian perspective. Mm -hmm. there, is, there is some of that, but largely there isn't. Um, it's, it's simply just a proper name and associates or you know, family counseling yeah. center. Um, so one often doesn't know what, they're, what mm -hmm. they're getting when they show up at the door. Do you think it's important, so let's say a, a potential client identifies as atheist and he or she is looking for a mental health provider do you think it's important that they find a mental health provider that is also an atheist or hmm. just atheist friendly? It's a complex question. Yeah. Um, we have some time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, I don't think it matters. I mean, to be honest, I, I, I think, frankly, if I was looking for a counselor, I don't know if that, even for me, someone deeply involved in this community, um, and, and this is a, a core part of who I am, mm -hmm. I actually would find the credentials, the experience, and the knowledge base of that provider paramount. Yeah. That being said, I know there are certain categories I wouldn't, no matter what their qualifications were and how esteemed they were in the field, would not be a fit mm -hmm. for me. So I would not make it a litmus test. I would not say if this, abs no, I could okay. not. Um, for the, I, I guess for the, for the primary reason, most providers are not out. There isn't any marketing oh, sure, tool yeah. for us as mm -hmm. atheist providers um, to market ourselves mm -hmm. very clearly. Um, so myself, in terms of what I have on my website, what I have on my business card, um, any of my marketing material, none of it identifies myself as an atheist, secular humanist, secular humanist mm -hmm. provider. But one, one thing I do mention, uh, when in doubt, and this isn't, again, an absolute, it, there's plenty of exceptions to this, but when in doubt, uh, what I would make as an absolute benchmark for me is I want a GLBT-friendly provider because that, in, in my opinion, would give me some um, evidence that they are of a similar worldview that I am, oh, okay, yeah. that they would have a value for human dignity. Mm -hmm. um, that, that is one, one simple way to get an impression really quickly what the philosophy of your provider is, if they give you the impression that that's a population that they serve. Okay, yeah, that, that was is kind easily of, marketed. Sure, yeah, it's probably easier to ask too. That because that, that was my next question is how how can you find out if if you go how covertly in, yeah. can you determine? Yeah, I mean, you said doing the research on the website, and but sometimes it's just not there. I, right. Um, some people might not think it's that important, or some people might be afraid of a negative right. connotation if they advertise that they're atheist or that they're Christian or whatever, so maybe they leave that out. So then you show up on your first visit where you're just kind of both feeling mm -hmm. each other out. How do you 
If you're in, another another uh, method, at least I've had clients report this to me. Okay, is that they and, and this isn't always going to be a, an, an option, but at least in my office, I have this very large bookshelf, and it's full of books, and it's full of books of multicultural perspectives, multi-religious perspectives, um, and and of course the, the the whole span of of various mental health concerns. Mm -hmm. And when a client looks at that bookshelf and they see the titles that they recognize, that they identify with, they feel comfortable. So when in doubt, as a default, look at that counselor's bookshelf. And now some of it might be textbooks or academic books yeah. that really you're not connecting with. But I would say 75% of the books on my shelf are popular that one could go to Barnes and Noble and, and, and pick out. Mm -hmm. So um, that's one way that clients have said right away they walked in and they felt comfortable because they said, I've, you know, I've read it two thirds of the books on your shelf. You know, I, I know you're the right person for me. Um, and and uh, I wouldn't, especially if you're going to this extent where you're meeting face to face, mm -hmm. ask that question. Things about, um, again, the question GLBT issues. Um, uh, do, do you have, um, is there a statement of faith associated with this clinic? Generally, that's going to be offered and discussed with you prior to getting in the door. But um, it, are, are, is this? You could even just simply say, "Is this a religious clinic? Do you have a religious identity?" Mm -hmm. I think that's a perfectly fair question. Um, if I was asked that question, I would answer it honestly okay. and directly, um, without hesitation. Uh, that being said, no one's ever asked me that. Oh, really? No okay. one's ever asked me what is your religion as a as a counselor. I've been asked plenty of questions about my credentials or background or how many years of experience I have, but that's commonly not an, an answer. Okay. What I find so interesting, James, as I was gonna offer in this program, is miraculously, despite my lack of marketing <laughs> yeah. about the fact that I'm an atheist mental health provider, it's amazing how many atheists I have in my caseload that found me for reasons that are as wide as, as you can imagine. I'm not quite sure why. I, you know, I don't necessarily believe in divine intervention. Is it word of mouth? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But I, or and I, I, I truly believe I'm not influencing. It's mm -hmm. not like I've I've converted anyone. They're walking in the door with mm -hmm. this yeah. with this perspective. Um, but it but it is interesting. Uh, large percentage. Huh. You know, if atheists only make up, you know, single digits in yeah. terms of our population. I, I, some days I feel half the people I talk to um, are identifying as atheists, and it's actually a factor in why they're to see me. Well, For example, they, they're being rejected from a family, or um, they they are feeling in they're in a bad marriage, and they're morally conflicted about mm -hmm. how to get out. Um, that these topics are relevant in our conversations. I guess if they've done some research, they must not have found anything about you that they found objectionable even if they didn't could explicitly be. ask you. It could be. So one thing I wanted to talk about that's um, kind of a side issue of this is how are uh, Christian or non-secular healthcare providers funded in this state? Oh, okay. That, that, that is, I think, for members of our community, secular <coughs> community, mm -hmm. I think this is a, an un, this is a topic that I don't think our community knows enough about and is outraged at a significant, at the sufficient level. Okay. Um, right now, um, there are, especially in the addiction field, there are, are uh, um, clinics or treatment centers that identify as religious providers. And they have statements of faith that are a requirement to participate in their program. So Must when a new client church. wants to, mm -hmm. okay. For example, a statement of faith might require one that you must attend certain church okay, services. Sure. You, you must meet with religious um, chaplaincy programs. Uh, you, you per perhaps you may even have requirements to participate in prayer. These, the funding for these programs are county funded. They're taxpayer dollars. Now, it may not be exclusively taxpayer funded. Mm -hmm. Sure, there are private donators. There's fundraising efforts plenty of other ways for these organizations to get funded, but the vast majority, or at least the majority mm -hmm. of funding for these programs are through Rural 25 funds and county medical assistance. And that's how these places are funded. And it's a separation of church and state. 
it, it, that's the issue. I, I yeah. see no, I, I'm, I'm not here to, to try to argue these organizations should be shut down or that they should be asked um, to practice in a different manner. I'm, I'm not trying to meddle in their, their programmatic choices. What I am concerned about is the taxpayer dollars used um, to promote an environment that is not GLBT friendly, that is, that is not welcoming to transgender populations, um, and, and that has a certain agenda beyond mental health. The agenda is religious indoctrination. That concerns me. Um, I've worked at two different treatment centers. Um, I do know the addiction field, and so these are my competitors, and uh, I've worked with their patients. I've worked with their patients intensely. And there is a sense of um, the religion is more important than, than servicing your mental health needs or your substance abuse needs. So I don't know if this is outside the scope of our program then, but so what can we do about it? Well, I, I think at least awareness <clears throat> is important. Um, Raise I, our level of rage, you said. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, and a, another factor is many, again, many of these programs um, do not have the word Christian or mm -hmm. Jewish or, or Muslim in the title of their facility. So they're, they're operating a, a bit with the understanding that the public may not have a full-scale knowledge of the level of religiosity is a part of their curriculum yeah. or, or their programmatic choices. And, and that concerns me as well because I've, I've heard countless stories um, from clients I've worked with directly and indirectly participating in these programs being sent away, sometimes in other parts of the state, away from their family, to find out that this is a religious program, and and they're stuck, mm -hmm. and their their insurance has authorized thirty days of care, yeah. and they're in in a small town that they're they don't have any resources. Um, it, that that uh, th there needs to be more understanding within our community that there should be an alternative. Um, I'm not necessarily saying we need a program of atheist counseling or atheist mental, atheist um, substance abuse treatment, mm -hmm. but an alternative in some markets is desperately needed. Um, there are certain suburbs and small towns in Minnesota where it's difficult to find providers that are not Christian or are not identifying as a part of this uh, Christian philosophy where a prayer at the beginning of a counseling session is normative. Um, and we need to raise our awareness and perhaps promote more programming that does foster um, exploration, um, critical thinking, and evidence-based care, not religious-based care. So regarding um, Alcoholics Anonymous, can that mm -hmm. be uh, court-mandated? Because many of those chapters are very religious, too. That, that's another concern I have. Okay. I, I, I go on record to say I'm, I'm actually quite a supporter of the AA okay. philosophy and um, what AA does in terms of helping people recover from addiction. With the caveat, um, again, I, I'm concerned about a separation of church and state issue. Mm -hmm. AA programs largely are religious, yeah. not exclusively. There are plenty of small chapters, individual groups that are very secular and are thriving. Not all AA has um, the Lord's Prayer said in the beginning okay. of, of the group, but there are some that do. Is it tough to find some of the more secular ones, again, like the healthcare providers in small town? I mean, when, here in Minneapolis, I'm sure it's doable, but. Uh, what, what I've, I've referenced to certain clients who are seeking a more secular approach and are very interested in AA is to find the most liberal zip code and look for, look for yeah. meetings in that most mm -hmm. liberal. For example, South Minneapolis. Um, I'm aware of many excellent, high quality groups, AA groups in South Minneapolis uh, that are very secular in nature. Um, perhaps the ones three blocks down are, are not. That's the challenge of AA. It's community based. Mm -hmm. There's not paid staff. There isn't professional staff. There's no licensed staff available. Um, and it's, it's it's, it's based on community needs and desires. So you're, you're gonna see a wide spectrum, but that's sometimes what makes AA so uh, useful, that you can find that wide spectrum. Um, if you not find what, what you're looking for in a certain meeting, it's, it's, it's so accessible, so plentiful, that you're gonna have another meeting 15 oh, okay. minutes yeah. later, <laughs> six blocks away. Yeah. 
Um, and and uh, that's and it's free, and that's something I really appreciate about AA. Couple of concerns though about this this kind of your question yeah. about court mandating. Concerns can be one one great thing about AA is I think I'm impressed that some of the, many of these groups, maybe all of them, greet people with no judgment. There's no shame and there's universal acceptance. Mm -hmm. That's a really powerful thing. It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic thing. But with that universal acceptance can create some concerns. That means that we have a group of very vulnerable people with no professional staff or leadership and universal acceptance and that, that can raise some red flags when we have court mandated Individuals, people with violent histories, oh, yeah. violent, violent, um, you know, violence against women, mm -hmm. and and there's been a couple of recent court cases where where women are victims of stalking or or um, um, sexual assault because you you have a group that's universally accepting yeah. and you're you're lumping some very vulnerable people mm -hmm. who are looking and searching desperately for that acceptance. Um, with some predators and without professional staff that concerns me. Yeah. It's a different animal sending a, um, an individual to court mandated treatment. Completely different mm -hmm. animal because there's procedures, yeah. staff. It's more standardized. It's, yeah. it's absolutely. There's, and there's more oversight. There's more regulation and there's accountability. If a person feels unsafe, they can call the board and, and there can be some um, uh, assistance to one. There isn't a, a, a licensing board or, or a credentialing board for AA. And, and when you have a population that can be profoundly vulnerable, mm -hmm. that concerns me. Uh, that's why I'm against courts mandating or, oh, okay. or, or requiring one to attend AA meetings. Uh, twofold, you know, protecting our most vulnerable populations, but also it, it is a concern of the separation of church and yeah, state. Yeah, I can see that. Many, yeah. many AA programs are overtly yeah. religious um, in, in a manner that one cannot, um, one cannot make exceptions or, or have an abridged version of the program. Okay. It's, it's too instrumental yeah. in order for one to make accommodations. Um, and, that, and I think that's a couple of the factors. There's many more. This is an mm -hmm. ongoing discussion. Uh, but again, I, I don't want to. I don't want anyone to write letters to me. I, I do support. <laughs> yeah. I do support AA. Yeah. I, I think it's. I think it's a good program. But I, we we have to understand also its limits. Okay, that, that's a very full answer. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for the information. Sure. So I did have down here. We kind of touched on this already. But what are difficulties in finding? Uh, atheist friendly healthcare professional or provider. You touched on it a little bit, but I don't know if you wanted to expound on it in our remaining minutes here. Well, um, I, I think I think the greatest barrier is many of us in the field are not willing to come out, mm -hmm. um, and many of us in the field are 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 using maiden names when we attach ourselves to uh, an atheist cause because of fear of. Oh, the community okay. mm -hmm. finding out that you happen to have a relationship or a commitment to a secular organization. Um, that, that breaks my heart. Um, that breaks my heart that we are living in a society where there, there isn't any room for one to have, um, well, a personal life, a private life. Yeah. Um, I, I recognize my job is kind of a more complex or unusual uh, job, but that shouldn't mean that I, I can't have my own private opinions and views. Mm -hmm. and. And, and I don't expect my clients to agree with a lot of my private decisions. Um, therefore, I, that's one barrier, that we're not talking about this yeah. often enough. Uh, the other barrier is I, I just think that the clients aren't, um, I'll do respect, I think many of us, this isn't on our register. This is, our, 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 the secular community doesn't register. This is um, a, a concern, uh, particularly if you are in a, an environment where you are facing a, a crisis, trauma, you often don't have the presence of mind to ask some of these questions. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that there's enough of a, um, enough communication for the, for the populations that are just simply desperate yeah. that, that this is, 
that are, there are certain safe places. We don't have a database right now of atheist identified providers. I'd like to start one. Oh, yeah. Any provider watching this program, please contact me <laughs> because I, I'd, like to, I'd like to get a short list. Um, I'd like to get a short list also of, of uh, secular addiction programs. Um, right now I'm running a, a group, um, a, a secular support group for um, members in the addicted community. Oh, okay. So uh, that's often tough to find. Just a one hour support group for people living with addiction uh, that don't necessarily feel connected to AA. Or they might find connection to AA, but they're looking for a secondary oh, okay, yeah. um, group of support. So it would be nice to have a database of all that. So together. that's, yeah. I, I mean, that's kind of a, a next step or, mm -hmm. a, or a future goal. Um, and likewise, I'm sure you could have other guests that have similar disciplines or, or industries where this would also be useful. Yeah. And, and to create more of a database or, or active communication about who who's recommended, who's who's got a knowledge and... Uh, just simply know the language of what it is to be a part of, our, you know, a secular community, and also have resources that match what we need. Um, Are there any resources available right now? Like, if I'm looking for a mental health care professional, I want one who's atheist or you know mm -hmm. secular. Where's the first place I can go? Is there a book or a website? Or? There, there is a national database okay. of secular providers, and off the top of my head, I'm, I'm not, I'm not real clear to, to give an exact website. Um, Just make something up. <laughs> it's it's uh, yeah. uh, secular mental health. I'm oh, sure you sure, could yeah. Google yeah. it. and um, But it's very small. And for example, I chose not to be a part of it. Even though it is password protected, and it, 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 is, it, it, it appears to be very professionally run, mm -hmm. um, there is a small database. But I, I'm not sure how many providers are even listed in Minnesota. Oh, okay. Um, and, I, I, I think there's a room for all of us at the table as well, um, er, you know, at all levels of the helping profession, licensed and unlicensed, yeah. um, addiction, um, um, psychiatric providers, not just the private practice clinician like myself, but there's also other exchanges that individuals might have with an emergency room nurse. Oh, sure, or, yeah. Um, and, and those kind of... Uh, uh, um, Partnerships or, or coordination of those resources are important too, and they don't exist. All right. So there's work cut out for for you, yes. for us. Yes. yes. Okay. Well, thank you for being Appreciate our guest. Appreciate you having me. Oh yeah, it was great. Thank you for the information. I hope that viewers listeners viewers slash listeners find it helpful, and thank you for watching our show today about uh, mental health care providers. And thank you, Jill, for being on the show again. If you would like to uh, contact us, if you're interested in the show, or if there's um, another topic that you'd like to see on our show, please do contact us because we would be happy to talk about that on here. Because if you're interested in us, we're interested in you. We'll even send you a copy of our newsletter if you contact us. So thank you again for watching. <laughs>